Number three, Harold Wayne Lovell. One day in May 1977, 19-year-old Harold Lovell, who went by his middle name, Wayne, got into an argument with his mother and stepfather. He left their Chicago home and he never returned. When he went missing, his family knew that he was looking for work in construction. They thought once he found a job and had time to cool off, he would get in contact with them. But he didn't. Then on December 1st, 1978, a year and a half after Wayne went missing, John Wayne Gacy was arrested. Gacy's home in Aurora, Illinois was searched and the remains of 29 young men were found buried under his house and around his property. Four more bodies were found dumped in a river not far from his home. The police were able to identify all but eight sets of remains. Wayne's family assumed that he had been one of Gacy's victims and he was one of the eight sets of unidentified remains. When Wayne went missing, Casey had already killed 20 young men. Wayne also fit Casey's victim profile. Wayne was a young man who worked in construction. Wayne's brother, Tim Lovell, and his sister, Teresa Hasselback, kept a scrapbook with news clippings about Casey. Tim also read several books about Casey. At the time that Wayne disappeared, Casey was doing construction on a fast food restaurant in Aurora. They assumed that Wayne got a job with Gacy and then Gacy killed him and buried him under his home. In early 1980, Gacy was convicted of 33 murders and he was sentenced to death. On May 10th, 1994, Gacy was executed via lethal injection. In 2001, Wayne Lovell's mother died, believing that her son had been killed by Gacy. Then in the fall of 2011, the police exhumed the remains of the eight unidentified victims. Then in early October 2011, they asked for families of men who may have been victims of Gacy's to get in contact with them. They wanted to compare their genetic profiles to the eight unidentified victims. Over 120 families got in contact with the police. Wayne's family was one of those families. Tim and Teresa both submitted samples of their DNA. But before the DNA could be compared, one of their family members made a remarkable discovery. He searched for Harold Wayne Lovell on mugshots.com and he found a mugshot of a man named Harold Wayne Lovell who was arrested in 2006 in Florida for marijuana possession. Tim and Teresa looked at the mugshot and they knew it was their missing brother. It turned out that Wayne was alive and he had spent most of the 34 years that he had been missing in Florida. When Tim and Teresa found out that their brother was alive, they called him on the phone. Not long afterward, Wayne got on a bus and traveled to Ozark, Alabama, where his sister was living, and he was reunited with his brother and sister. Wayne said that he left home because he never felt like he was wanted there. He said that he did meet Gacy, and he did some yard work for him. After that, he traveled to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, because it was hot and sunny there. He continued to live in Florida where he worked as a shipbuilder and a landscaper. He said that he never stopped thinking about his family while he was away from them. He said he felt terrible that they thought he had been murdered. But he said it was awesome that they were reunited after 34 years. Since the eight bodies were exhumed in 2011, only two have been identified. One was identified in November 2011. He was 19-year-old William Bundy who went missing in October 1976. Then in July 2017, 
Another set of remains was identified as 16-year-old James Hackinson, who went missing in the summer of 1976. The police are still looking for family members of the remaining six victims so they can get genetic profiles from them so that all of Gacy's victims will finally be identified. Number 2. Flora Stevens In the summer of 1975, 36-year-old Flora Stevens and her husband, Robert Stevens, were working at the Concord Resort in Monticello, New York. They were both seasonal workers who were employed at the resort during the summer. Flora went to high school about 90 miles away in Yonkers, New York. When Flora applied for the seasonal job as a chambermaid and substitute waitress, she wrote that her address was in Seattle, Washington. August 3, 1975 was a Sunday. Sundays were checkout days at the resort and the staff was usually paid their tips for the week. Flora picked up her tips and then at 6 p.m. her husband Robert dropped her off at the hospital in Monticello for a scheduled appointment. Robert returned to the hospital two hours later to pick her up and he couldn't find her. He reported her missing that evening. The police investigated Flora's disappearance and they interviewed her co-workers and friends. They also interviewed the hospital staff who was working on the evening that she disappeared. But their investigation didn't lead to Flora's whereabouts. For years, her case sat cold. The police would look in her file and check missing persons databases every so often, but they found no clues as to what happened to Flora. In 1985, Robert died without ever finding out what happened to his wife. Then in September 2017, some skeletal remains of a female were found in Orange County, New York. Orange County is next to Sullivan County, where Monticello is located. The head and the hands from the woman were missing. The state police looked through missing persons reports and they thought the remains could have been Flora Stevens. They called the police in Sullivan County and asked that they could track down a DNA sample from one of Flora's family members. But the police in Sullivan County ran into a bit of a roadblock because Flora didn't have any living relatives. Then they decided to do a search to see if there had been any activity on Flora's social security number. It turned out that a woman named Flora Harris was using the social security number. Flora Harris was residing in an assistant living facility in Lowell, Massachusetts. Flora Harris had the same birthday as Flora Stevens. The detectives got a strong feeling that Flora Harris and Flora Stevens were the same person. The detectives got in contact with the officials at the assistant living facility and they asked about Flora Harris. They told them that she had been living in the facility since 2001. She had dementia and she could only say one or two words at a time. On October 24, 2017, two detectives from Sullivan County traveled to Lowell to interview Flora Harris. They showed her a photograph of the Concord Resort where Flora Stevens worked when she went missing and she said, wow. Then they showed her a photograph of Flora Stevens' husband, Robert, and she said, Robert. Then they showed her a photograph of Flora Stevens, and she said, me. The detectives concluded that Flora Harris was, indeed, Flora Stevens. They had found her 42 years after she went missing. But because of her mental condition, she was not able to explain why she disappeared and where she went after she left the hospital. The police speculated that after Flora was dropped off at the hospital, she made her way to a bus station that was near the hospital. They think it's possible that at the time of her disappearance, she was having mental problems or she may have suffered amnesia. 
What the police do know from her medical records is that she was given a guardian in 1987, about 12 years after she went missing. She also lived, at least part-time, in care facilities in New York City and in New Hampshire. During that time, she suffered some abuse, and there was one record of her being assaulted. In 2001, she moved into the facility in Lowell. A worker who helped care for Flora for nearly a decade said that she was very secretive about her past. The worker said that Flora grew up in Yonkers and she was once a hairdresser. In 1969, Flora attended the Woodstock Music Festival. The worker said that Flora mentioned she was married once and the marriage was an unhappy one. She said that her husband was abusive. The detectives did not comment on the allegation that Robert was abusive. After finding Flora, the detectives closed her case, even though they don't really know why she disappeared and what she did during the time that she was missing. The skeletal remains that were found in Orange County that started the detectives on their search for Flora have not been identified. Number 1. Jack Rosenthal On April 26, 1964, Dora Franzak gave birth to a baby boy named Paul in the Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. That night, Paul was placed in the nursery to sleep. Sometime during the night, a woman dressed as a nurse came into the nursery and took Paul. She walked out of the hospital and got into a cab. The staff at the hospital didn't contact the police or tell Paul's parents about the abduction until the next afternoon. When the police were finally notified, a massive search was launched. By midnight, 600 homes had been searched, but no trace of baby Paul was found. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of the police, the case went cold. Nearly two years later, in March 1966, Paul's parents, Dora and Chester, received a letter from the FBI. The letter explained that an abandoned toddler boy had been found nearly 800 miles away in Newark, New Jersey on July 2, 1965, about 14 months after Paul was born. The boy had been found in a stroller in a busy shopping center. A detective in Newark thought it was possible that the boy might be Paul. The problem was that there was no way to verify that. The hospital staff didn't get handprints or footprints from the baby. They also didn't take any blood so they can compare blood types. The only thing they had was a photograph of Paul that was taken hours after he was born. The FBI compared the shape of the year of the boy found in Newark to the shape of the year of Dora and Chester's missing son. They thought it was close enough of a match, so the boy was sent to live with Chester and Dora. When Paul was 10 years old, he found a box that was full of sympathy cards and newspaper clippings about the kidnapping. Paul had never heard about the kidnapping, so he went and asked his mother about it. She got angry with him for snooping, but explained that he had been kidnapped and the police found him. As Paul grew up, he began to wonder if his family was his biological family. He thought what were the odds that he was Doran Chester's son. After all, comparing the shape of his ear to the ear of a baby in a photograph wasn't exactly the most scientifically accurate way to confirm his identity. Chester and Dora were loving parents, but Paul never felt like he fit in. He didn't look like the rest of his family, and he had different interests. Then in 2008, Paul's wife was pregnant, and the doctor asked about his family history. Paul wasn't exactly sure what to say. 
Paul wanted his parents to take a paternity test, not because he wasn't happy, but because he wanted to know the truth. The problem was that paternity tests were too expensive. Then in 2012, he found an over-the-counter DNA test that was affordable, so he bought one. Not long afterward, Dora and Chester flew from their home in Chicago to visit Paul, who was living in Las Vegas, Nevada. Paul asked them if they ever wondered if he was really their son, and they admitted they had thought about it. So Paul asked them to swab their cheeks for a paternity test, and they agreed. But after Doran Chester returned to Chicago, they called Paul and asked him not to submit the DNA. They said that Paul was their son, and he should leave it at that. A few weeks later, Paul decided he wanted to know the truth, so he sent in the DNA. It turned out that there was no chance that Doran Chester were his biological parents. When his family found out that he submitted the DNA, they were furious and they didn't talk to him for over a year. During that time, Paul tried to discover his real identity. The FBI also reopened the kidnapping of Chester and Dora's child. Then a team of DNA experts volunteered to investigate Paul's identity. On June 3, 2015, they figured out that Paul was actually named Jack Rosenthal. Even though his birth name was Jack Rosenthal, Paul continued to use the name Paul Frosnack. It turned out that he was born on October 27, 1963, making him six months older than he thought he was. He also learned that he was born and lived as a baby in Tennessee. He had family who was still living in Tennessee and he reunited with them. The most shocking news that Paul learned was that he had a twin sister named Jill and she had gone missing too. When Paul reunited with his estranged family, he learned about his biological parents. It turned out that Paul's birth mother had been a heavy drinker. His father served in the Korean War, and when he returned home, his mood was much darker, and he was an angry man. Paul also learned that he had two older sisters and a younger brother. Relatives said that Paul and his siblings were neglected. One cousin recalled seeing babies locked up in cages. In early 1965, when Paul and his twin sister were toddlers, family members stopped seeing the twins. When people would ask about them, their parents would say another relative was looking after them. After a while, people stopped asking about them. While Jack had been found, the whereabouts of his twin sister, Jill, has been a mystery for nearly 54 years. Paul thinks that something happened to Jill, and she died. Having one twin would only lead to questions about what happened to the other twin, so he was abandoned in Newark. Paul has searched for any trace of his twin sister, but he has found nothing. He hopes that one day he'll find a clue as to what happened to her. Another mystery is what happened to Dora and Chester's son, the real Paul Franzak. One theory is that he may have been kidnapped by a woman named Linda Taylor. Taylor rose to fame in 1976 after a series of articles were published in the Chicago Tribune and Jet Magazine about Taylor's extensive welfare fraud. When Ronald Reagan started to run for president, he used Taylor's stories in his campaign speeches. He called her the welfare queen, and he used her story as a way to critique the welfare system. Taylor used 80 different names, 30 addresses, and 15 phone numbers to collect social benefits like food stamps and welfare. In 1976, when she was facing charges of fraud, she drove to the courthouse in a Cadillac, and she wore expensive clothes and jewelry. Linda Taylor may have also killed a woman. 
1974, Taylor moved in with Patricia Parks and her three children. Parks hired Taylor to clean up around the house and watch her three children. Not long after Taylor moved in, Parks' health took a turn for the worse. On June 15, 1975, six months after Taylor moved in, Parks, who was 37 years old, died. Taylor told the funeral home that Parks had cervical cancer. The funeral home did a blood test and they didn't find any traces of cancer. But they did find high levels of barbiturates. They labeled her cause of death as drug intoxication. Before she died, Taylor convinced Parks to make her the beneficiary of several life insurance policies and the guardian of her three children. The police suspected that Taylor killed Parks, but they couldn't find enough evidence to charge her. When baby Paul Fronsnack was kidnapped, Taylor was considered a suspect, but the police did not find any evidence to connect her to the kidnapping. In 2013, after airing an episode about the kidnapping of Paul Fronzak, the television program, 2020, got a tip that they should look into Linda Taylor. They learned that Taylor died in April 2002. Reporters with 2020 were able to track down Taylor's son, Johnny Harbaugh, and they asked him if he thought it was possible that his mother was the person who kidnapped Paul. Harbaugh said it was quite possible. He said that his mother was capable of anything. Harbaugh said that when he was a teenager, he remembered playing with a baby boy who his mother called Tiger. Then one day, the baby was just gone. Harbaugh said that his mother told him that one of her boyfriends took the baby away. Harbaugh said that his mother was known to pick up and ditch kids. She would claim them as her own to get social benefits and then she would get rid of them. Harbaugh was never really sure what she did with the children. He said they would be there one day and then the next day they were just gone. Harbaugh isn't even convinced that Taylor was his biological mother. He thinks he may have been stolen from another couple. Harbaugh also said that his mother was a master of disguise who had several different uniforms and a lot of wigs. Some of the uniforms she had in her closet were nurses uniforms. While the police didn't find any physical evidence that proved Taylor kidnapped Paul, they did find an interesting item in Taylor's possession. It was a birth certificate for a boy born four months before Paul was kidnapped. The doctor who signed the birth certificate gave up his medical license a couple years after he signed the birth certificate to avoid prosecution for selling prescription drugs to minors. When the police asked Taylor where the boy was, she said he was in foster care. But the police never found any evidence that the boy named in the birth certificate ever existed. It's thought that Taylor got the fake birth certificate and then she kidnapped Paul so she had a baby to match the birth certificate. Then she used the birth certificate and Paul to collect some type of social benefit. Once she got the benefit, she somehow got rid of Paul. However, this is only speculation. The whereabouts of the real Paul Fronsnack is still a mystery. Paul Fronsnack, whose birth name is Jack Rosenthal, hopes that the real Paul Fronsnack is alive. He has his birth certificate and he wants to give it to him. If Paul Fronsnack is still alive, he'll be 50 in April 2019. Thank you so much for watching today's video, hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it.
Also, please go to criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases by merge and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thank you again for watching.